Welcome to lecture 11, free body diagrams and 2D rigid body equilibrium. In this lecture, I'll be discussing the conditions for rigid body equilibrium, the equations of equilibrium that we will be using in two dimensional situations, the process for solving rigid body equilibrium problems. We'll revisit free body diagrams and also discuss two force members. Up until now, our equilibrium work in the course has been restricted to particles. And remember that particles have mass, but no geometry. They just occupy a single point in space. So for um, bodies or parts or things that um, where we could ignore their geometry and model them as a single point, uh, we would model them as a particle. And for particle equilibrium, we said that the sum of the forces on the particle uh, have to be equal to zero. And we didn't have to worry about moments because we were dealing with concurrent force systems where the lines of action of all the forces we were dealing with acted through the particle. And now with, uh, we're going to expand that uh, equilibrium, we're going to expand our equilibrium work to rigid bodies where we now uh, not only have to worry about the forces uh, acting on the body, but also the moments. And for the for a rigid body to be in equilibrium, the sum of the forces acting on the body have to be zero, as well as the sum of the moments acting on the body have to be zero. And by rigid body, uh, we're assuming that the body does not deform when forces and moments are applied to it. In a previous lecture, we established that a system of forces and moments acting on a body can be reduced to a single resultant force by summing all the forces and a single resultant moment about any arbitrary point O that can be on or off the body, it doesn't matter. And that resultant moment is the sum of the free moments or couple moments acting on the body, as well as the couple moments created when the forces are moved to point O. For equilibrium of the body to exist, then that resultant force must be equal to zero, just like for particle equilibrium, which means that the body is not moving in space, it's not translating. And unlike particle equilibrium, the sum of the moments must also equal zero meaning that the body is not rotating. Let's look at equilibrium in two dimensions by considering the body shown in the figure. And that body is subjected to a system of forces that all lie in the same plane and we'll assume the XY plane. And if that body is in equilibrium, then the net force and net moment on the body uh, have to be equal to zero, as we established on the previous slide. And when we're working in two dimensions, the equilibrium condition can be represented by these three scalar equations, where we can take the forces in XY, break them into their X and Y components, and say that the sum of the forces in the X direction have to be equal to zero. The sum of the forces in the Y direction have to be equal to zero, exactly the same as particle equilibrium. 
But now if the, with a rigid body, we have to consider the moments acting on the body. And so the sum of those moments also have to be equal to zero. And we're going to sum those, we can sum those moments about any arbitrary uh, point O that's on or off the body. To solve rigid body equilibrium problems, whether we're working in 2D or 3D, we will use three basic steps. The first step is to create an idealized model of the situation. So here we have an actual physical system, uh, a ramp on the back of a some type of trailer that's held up by uh, two chains. And we've determined that we can model this in 2D, probably given the symmetry of the situation. And so we model it by drawing it or uh, producing a CAD model or, or uh, what have you of it. And we want to include all the important dimensions and connections and all the important uh, uh, pieces. The next thing we're going to do is to draw a free body diagram of that model showing all of the external forces and couple moments that act on the body as shown here. So we're going to remove the ramp, um, cut it away uh, if you will, from the trailer. And so we'll have to cut the cable and replace it by the tension that's acting on the ramp. We need to show the weight of the ramp acting through the center of gravity of the ramp. And then we need to uh, need to show the reaction force uh, at A, we also call this the support reactions at A. We're going to talk about uh, support reactions um, in the next few slides. And once we have a valid rigid, uh, excuse me, a valid free body diagram, then we will apply the equations of <clears throat> equilibrium to solve for any unknowns. And in the 2D case, we'd be applying the three equations that we uh, established on the previous slide. And in the 3D case, as we'll see in the next lecture, we'll have a total of six uh, equations to apply to the 3D uh, situation. In order to create useful free body diagrams, you'll need to become familiar with the common types of supports used in engineering mechanics and the reactions that occur between these supports and the rigid bodies that uh, you'll be analyzing. Now, as a general rule, if a support prevents translation of a body in a given direction, then when you uh, remove the rigid body from that support, you would show a force on the body in the opposite direction. And if rotation is prevented, then you would show a couple moment exerted on the body in the opposite direction uh, of that prevented rotation. So let's look at a couple of uh, common types of supports here. Now you'll find a more extensive uh, table in your text or it shouldn't be hard to uh, uh, Google a uh, uh, mechanics uh, support, support reaction type table uh, and, and use that. The first one we're gonna look at is a roller support and think about a roller here, it's not restraining the body from moving in this direction up and 
down the plane here that it's riding on, but it is holding the body via the connection at this pin away from the, the ground or the surface there. So when we remove that pin that's connecting the link to the, that's connecting the body, I called it a link, to the support roller, we would show a force perpendicular to the uh, to the surface that's angled at uh, the angle theta. Another one uh, we're going to see a lot is just a, a, a pin connection or a hinge. So in this case, the link or the body is free to rotate about that connection, but that pin, um, pinning the uh, body to the support uh, is keeping the body from translating. So we could show a force F at some acting at some unknown angle theta, which is, you know, an unknown force, unknown direction, two unknowns, but we more generally show that as just the two components, the X and Y components of the force. Okay, if you know F sub X and F sub Y, you can calculate uh, the magnitude F and the direction theta and vice versa. Another type of uh, common support is called a fixed support. And this is known as a cantilever beam. So imagine that beam is stuck into the side of a building or bolted to the side of a building. And when you cut that beam away from the building and replace uh, and, and show the, re, uh, the reaction uh, that was being caused by that connection, not only was the, that uh, support keeping the body from translating, it was also keeping the body from rotating either clockwise or counterclockwise. So we're gonna show a moment there Okay. And as we'll see in a few slides, we don't always know which way these support reactions are, gonna, are going to act, and we make an assumption. And um, if it, uh, if the when we solve for that reaction, if uh, the uh, result comes out negative, then then we know that we've uh, that we assume the wrong direction and. Um, we simply uh, e express that uh, in our answer. Armed with a little bit of knowledge about supports and support reactions, let's now look at the steps in creating a free body diagram of a rigid body. So in this example, we're going to be creating a free body diagram of a cantilever beam that has a mass of 100 kilograms, is six meters long, and has a 1200 Newton load applied two meters from the connection point uh, to a building. So the first thing we want to do is draw an outline shape of the of the rigid body and we're going to imagine that we've cut the body free from its constraints uh, when we draw that and so our first step 
would be to actually draw the beam uh, as shown here in the right figure. Uh, we would draw this beam and this is a pretty fancy drawing. We could just draw a box, a rectangle uh, for our purposes. And the next thing we will do is then populate that uh, representation of the cutaway beam with all the external forces and couple moments that are acting on it. So you can think of it in this order, but it doesn't matter. But we can first look at all the applied loads to the beam where the 1200 newton force acting vertically down two meters from the uh, connection point is our only applied load but we could have several or or many more applied loads we would just show them one at a time and populate the, the, the diagram with those. Next, we'll look at our support reactions. Now, we looked at this on a previous slide. This is a fixed support. So we're going to show the two components of an unknown force acting at A. And a fixed support restricts the, or, or uh, counters any uh, rotation of the beam. It prohibits any rotation of the beam. So there must be a moment there to keeping the rigid body from rotating. So we're gonna show that. And then we need to account for the weight of the body. And we would show that acting through the center of gravity of the beam. In this case, we, we're assuming that the beam is, uh, that the center of gravity is at the center of the beam, that it's a, a constant um, geometry, thickness, all that beam. So the center of gravity is just at the center. And we know that the mass of the beam is 100 kilograms. So our weight is going to be 981 newtons. Okay, now we're going to label everything, um, all of our loads and then any dimensions uh, that we need to include. And we need to show any known magnitudes of loads or the weight and directions as we we've already done. And we need to label any unknown forces or moments uh, in some manner. And like we've done before in the course, um, here's point A. So we'll call these unknown forces a sub y, a sub x, and then this, the moment about a. And we need to show any necessary dimensions. And we also need to establish our reference uh, axes or coordinate system. Most of the problems we're going to use at the standard y, x, um, uh, reference, but not always. And so you do need to show that even though we use this reference most of the time, you still need to show it for a complete free body diagram. Once your free body diagram is complete, you can then start solving for the unknowns using the three equations of equilibrium that we established earlier in the lecture. Now this is assuming you're, you're working uh, 
2D rigid body equilibrium problems. We'll address 3D rigid body equilibrium problems in the next lecture. Here's some important things to keep in mind uh, as you work these equilibrium problems. If you have more unknowns than you do independent equations, then the situation is statically indeterminate. So in other words, if you're working a 2D equilibrium problem and you have four unknowns, you only have three independent equations to solve for those unknowns, so you're not going to get there. So what you need to do in that situation is be absolutely sure that there are actually four unknowns, that there's not something that, um, um, you know, something you've overlooked and you actually only have three unknowns. But if you do really have more unknowns uh, then you do equations, then you cannot solve the problem using just statics. Another thing is, is that the order in which you apply the equations um, can affect the simplicity of, of the solution. Now, we, we saw this some in when we just had two equations uh, for part, 2D particle equilibrium. Sometimes it was better to sum forces in the x direction before summing forces in the y direction. So think about that. Now you've got three equations. You've got some of the forces in the x equals zero, some of the forces in the y equals zero, as well as some of the moments uh, equals zero. So how you, uh, the order in which you write those equations may make a big difference in uh, uh, how uh, quick your solution goes. And the last thing I mentioned before, um, for uh, unknown forces and, and moments, um, uh, sometimes when you're creating a free body diagram, it's, it's obvious which way, what, what direction an unknown force or moment is acting but um, a lot of times it's not. So just assume a direction for the force or moment. And when you solve for it, if the uh, answer for that particular unknown uh, comes out to be negative, then that means that the sense or direction that you assumed when you created the FBD uh, is opposite to the actual direction. Being able to recognize the presence of what's known as a two-force member in an equilibrium problem can greatly simplify things. Uh, as their name implies, a two-force member is a, a rigid body that's subjected to forces at only two points. Um, a good example is a, a link that's pinned at its two ends. So let's imagine we're starting to draw a free body diagram of this rigid body that's been cut away from its surroundings. And we show a force in an, uh, we show an unknown force and in, in an unknown direction um, at one cut and an unknown force in an unknown direction at the other cut. Now, if we look at this rigid body, if it's in equilibrium, then we know that the sum of the forces has to be equal to zero. So therefore, these two forces, the only two forces acting on the body, have to be equal in magnitude. So we'll set them both equal to F. And they have to be opposite in direction. Okay, so we're showing that also. And for this rigid body to be in equilibrium, 
the sum of the moments on acting on the body have to be equal to zero. And if that's the case, then in the second figure here, we have a force couple, which creates a couple moment. So the sum of the moments, the way we have it drawn right now, cannot be equal to zero. If they are equal to zero, then we know that the forces are not only equal and opposite, but they act along the same line of action. So there's no couple moment created. So what this does for us is it eliminates, normally eliminates an unknown because you're normally given uh, some dimensions and some geometry. And although you don't know the magnitude of this unknown force, you do know that these two forces are equal. And so that cuts down on an unknown. And more often than not, you're probably going to know the uh, direction of the force, but not all the time. So being able to identify a two force member can eliminate one or two unknowns um, from your uh, analysis, which, you know, can make things a lot easier.